Well, let's go to the Lord in prayer this morning. Father, we come to you this morning in the name of Jesus, and I thank you for bringing us here together. Lord, I thank you for the wonderful worship music, and and uh, I thank you for all the praise reports that we've heard. I thank you that you are still in control and you're still moving. And I lift up each of these requests to you. You know every need. You know the destruction in western Kentucky. You know those who are sick and uh, suffering physically or suffering emotionally or all of the above. <clears throat> Lord, excuse me. Move in each of these situations according to your wisdom and power and glory in Christ Jesus. <clears throat> Lord, as we go to your word this morning, I ask you to anoint me that the words I speak would not be mine but yours, that they be spirit and truth and would not return void but would accomplish what you sent them to do. Give us listening ears and open hearts to receive your word, and I praise you and thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Well, we are continuing this morning on uh, Living 101. The first section, I want to make sure I get these right. First week, it was about money. The second topic was work. And now we're on marriage, which can be work, actually. But <laughs> can, <laughs> or, and it can be a great blessing, too. Uh, <laughs> want to get that in. <laughs> the next time it'll be a couple of weeks we're going to talk about parenting and uh, even parenting adult children and then we're finally going to talk about the senior years of our lives as I said I started off calling that old age and then I thought well that might go over like a lead balloon so we'll call it the golden years that's what we'll call it entering into the golden years but today this is marriage part two. We started last week on this. Um, I won't be preaching, I don't think, the next couple of weeks because next week we have the Christmas pageant and then the week after that is our rotation and Neil uh, Cornett is joining our rotation and he will be preaching in the next, in the next segment. So uh, I'll tell a joke. I told the deacons this, this morning. It's not a joke. It's Serious, Neil said he was a little nervous about preaching because he didn't think he had enough to say that he could go beyond 10 minutes. <laughs> and I said, I've been in this an awful long time, and the one complaint I have never heard <laughs> ever is that a sermon was too short <laughs> or that a service ended too quick. So I said, just, you know, whatever you got, lay it out there. Um, last week we talked about the first three points I had on marriage. The first point was be a servant. The second point was play to each other's talents. And the third point was be thankful for who your spouse is instead of trying to make him or her into somebody they're not. Okay? And this morning we will pick up with the fourth point. There are eight all together, so we'll be doing five today, did three last week, and the fourth point is, and I, this you would think that this would go without saying, and maybe it does, but it's also very, very important, the, and maybe one of the most or the most important thing, but number four is to build a strong marriage, be faithful, all right? Hebrews, I forgot to write down the scripture uh, passage, but if memory serves me, I believe you can double, somebody can double check me on this. I believe it's Hebrews 13, 4 says, let the marriage be held in honor among everyone and let the marriage bed be undefiled. In other words, a big part of marriage is trust. And you can't have uh, a really strong union, a strong bond with somebody unless they trust you and you trust them, okay? And the best way to be trusted is to be trustworthy, right? So whatever else happens, we are to be faithful to our spouse, 
We are to, to do our best to be faithful to that spouse. But it, it doesn't just mean don't fool around with somebody else. Don't bring a third party into the marriage. I think being faithful is about more than that, which I think being faithful means also being faithful in, in the form of being devoted to your spouse, putting your spouse before other people and before other things, that your primary focus besides the Lord and sometimes your children is to be on your husband or on your wife. Be faithful to them. Don't be faithful to your hobby. Don't be faithful to your buddies. I mean, you can be faithful to your buddies and to your hobby, but be faithful to your spouse first. Be faithful. I don't know much. I, I kind of brainstormed about this and tried to come up with some examples, but I don't know much more to say about being faithful except to say, be faithful. Just do the right thing, you know? Be dependable. Be trustworthy. Be the kind of person that your spouse can trust, you know? And hopefully your spouse will return that favor to you. Start to say, does anybody want to add anything to that? I've never had a point that short, but I just couldn't think of anything else to say about that except do the right thing. Here's number five. Number five is listen. Listen. Be fully present. Put down your phone. Turn off the game. Your spouse wants to be seen and heard sometimes. Doesn't mean you can never watch another game ever again. It doesn't mean that, you know, that you can't ever have a phone conversation ever again. But what it means is, particularly when a serious subject matter is at hand, or maybe your wife or your husband just want, wants to tell you about their day at work or whatever it is, be present. Bring your mind back into the room. As I said, put the phone down and take a few minutes to just listen. Chris Rock used to have this great routine about how when, according to him, when his wife got cranked up and started talking, he knew it was his job to listen, but he just couldn't quite do it. You know, like he couldn't concentrate on what what uh, she was saying, but he, you know, I'm not doing it nearly as well as he did, but his routine was that his way was... <laughs> you know, just to throw in the right interjections at the right moment that he could kind of monitor her tone and he would say, you don't say, really? Well, that old bitty, I can't believe, you know. And then, and then in between those, he can just go anywhere in his mind he wanted to. John Bryan has a whole song about that. It's called Linda Goes to Mars. And he said... I just found out yesterday that Linda goes to Mars. Every time I sit and look at pictures of used cars, you know, <laughs> he was, and he goes on, he goes on from there. But basically, he's saying he's realized finally that when he's doing the things he really thinks are important and interesting, his wife checks out and goes to Mars. Well, the moral of the story is try not to check out and go to Mars. We are all tempted to do that. Anybody who has ever, ever been married knows that when you've already heard the story 14 times, you know, the 15th time is hard to concentrate on. Right, Liz? <laughs> In marriage, we become like this old story. I've told this one before, but I love this story about the monks in the monastery, you know. And uh, the guy comes to visit the monast monastery, the young guy, and he's sitting with the monk who is his host. And they sit, they sit down to eat. And in the middle of lunch, one of the monks kind of raises up and goes, Number 11, 
and they all burst out <laughs> and they're beating the table and just having a big time, you know. And then a few minutes later, another monk on the other side of the cafeteria says, number 61, and all oh, they just crack up. And finally, the, the young guy says to the old monk, he said, what in the world's going on? And the old monk says, well, you know, we've been locked up in this monastery together for 40, 50, 60 years. And he said, we heard every joke everybody else has. And so what we finally decided to do was just number them. And then we don't have to go through the rigmarole of telling the joke. We just cite the number. And he said, that's what's going on. And people are cracking up at, at, at the jokes. And the, the young guy says, can I try that? And the old monk says, well, I have had it. He says, number 22, dead silence. They just look at him and go right on eating their gruel. And he turns to the old monk. He said, when the other guys did that, it got a big laugh. I did it. He said, it just went over like nothing. What happened? The old monk says, well, you know what they say. Some people can tell them and some people can't. <laughs> But anyway, the point being, that's about where we get, you know, in, in a relationship. As the relation, when you're first in a relationship with somebody and you're infatuated and all that stuff's going on, everything they have to say is the most thrilling thing you've ever heard. They are the smartest person you ever met. They're the funniest person you ever met. And you know, you just can't get enough. And then as the years wax on, you know, the <laughs> The newness wears off, and, and it just becomes routine. But people, men and women alike, need to be genuinely listened to. And part of the duty of a spouse to have a healthy relationship is to be present Mentally, emotionally present. Now, you can't do that all the time, 24-7. I, I will fully admit, when Liz is talking, I'm not always exactly listening, okay? And, and when I talk, she's not always exactly listening. And I will say to her sometimes, something comes up, and I say, why didn't you tell me that? Why didn't you tell me this was going on? And she's like, I did tell you that. We were standing right over there. And I said, blah, blah, blah. And I said, well, I didn't hear it. She said, oh, no, you were, you were gone somewhere, but your body was present. I told you this, and clearly I knew you were just in another world, but I did tell you. And I have to take your word for that because I admit maybe I wasn't listening. But when the matters at hand are serious, and when the person really needs to talk and they need to unburden themselves, they've just had a terrible day, take a few minutes and open your mind and open your ears and focus your eyes and just listen. Also, and this is mostly for the men, women do this too sometimes, but it's been my observation, men do this more often than women do, at least the men I know, is Sometimes, guys, when you're listening to your wife, the object is not to fix what's wrong, okay? You know, I think we're wired such that our first response is when they tell us, I have a problem, somebody at work is doing this and this and this, let's say, or the kids did this and this and this, or whatever, our, I know my first inclination is to say, oh, well, I'll tell you what you do about that. You know, step one, step two, step three, problem fixed. What are we eating for supper tonight? You know, and move on. And I finally learned a long time ago, and I try to remind myself of this all the time, that when women tell you their problems, your wife tells you her problems, and sometimes it's the same with men, but particularly when your wife tells you her problems, she doesn't want you to fix it. She doesn't even need you to fix it. She can fix it on her own. Sometimes she doesn't even want it fixed. It's just an ongoing thing and she's got to deal with it. And your job is not to fix. Your job is to listen. Just listen. Remember Chris Rock. Really? Wow. How about that? No, she did. You know? 
So listen, number six, the sixth thing is, and this is very much related to listening, the other thing is talk. Don't just listen, talk. By which I mean, trust your mate with your heart. Tell your mate the truth. Explain yourself when you do something. Explain if it's a little touchy issue. Explain calmly why you why you did what you did the way you did it. You know, tell them what you're worried about. Tell them what's going on. One caveat to talking is it's best not to talk when you're mad. Okay? Don't try to talk then. Wait till you cool off. But if you've got a problem with your spouse, talk to them about the problem in a calm, rational way without calling names or, you know, blaming them. But talk. Talk about the good stuff. Talk about the bad stuff. And as much as anything, talk to them about the fact that you love them. Tell them, you are precious to me. You matter to me. I'm so glad God gave you to me. If you can't do that with a straight face, cross your fingers behind your back. <laughs> but make the other person feel valued. Reminds me of the story about the two old, old farmers. They got together one day at the stockyards, and they were talking. One of them asked him how the other, his wife was doing. He said, well, I'll tell you what. He said, I've had the the greatest experience with my wife. He said, you know, this past weekend was our 25th anniversary. And he said, I wasn't too hepped up about that, but I could tell she was. She wanted me to take her out to a restaurant to eat. And he said, uh, okay. So he said, I took her out for that restaurant. And she wanted to go to this really nice place with the candles and all that foo-foo st stuff. But he said, I was sitting there at the table and he said, I looked across the table at her and that candle light, and I realized we've been together. We've been married for 25 years, and she's the mother of my children, and she's been so good to me for all this time. I don't know what I would do without her. He said, I was so filled up suddenly with love for her. I didn't know what to do. He said, I was so filled up, I almost told her. <laughs> Don't be that guy, okay? <laughs> tell her, tell him. You know, last time I talked about being thankful for who your spouse is. Well, don't just be thankful to God. Be thankful to the spouse. Tell your husband, tell your wife, I love you. This is why I love you. I am glad to be with you. Now, <laughs> that's... Reminds me of another joke. This is an El Paul joke. An El Paul joke. I don't think I've told this one here, but we probably have. But talked about the guy that got so filled up about, you know, with uh, empathy and, and, and love for his wife that he sent her a dozen roses. And he walked in the house, saw the roses sitting on the table. And the minute he walked in the house, she looked at him and just busted out crying. She was just boo-hoo and crying. He said, what in the world is the matter with you? She said, he said, I sent you a dozen roses. I'm trying to, you know, do something right. And you're upset. And you're crying. And what in the world is going on? She said, I woke up this morning. The coffee maker broke. She said, I, at lunch, I spilled everything in the floor. She said, the kids have been crazy all day long and, and just about tore the house down Everything that has gone wrong all day could that could go wrong has gone wrong. And now I've learned you're having an affair. <laughs> the roses, you know what I mean? <laughs> anyway, it's better when El Paul tells it, but I, I don't have to do that. So talk. Learn to express your emotions in healthy ways. Don't hold everything in. I had a relative who uh, was married for a long time, a number of years, and after about, well, not a long time, about 10 years, and 
got a divorce. Just suddenly out of the blue, they got a divorce. And some of the family were asking her, what in the world happened? You know, never saw any signs of trouble there. And she said, well, you know, I didn't either. She said, I thought we had this great marriage. And she said, we've been married for 10 years and never had an argument. In 10 years, we never had an argument. And she said, and then one day, we got in an argument. And she said, when we got in the argument, he started dredging up all this stuff that I did 10 years ago and eight years ago and six years ago and four years ago. And she said, I thought we were getting along great. He'd been mad the whole time and was holding all this stuff in that I didn't even know was wrong. And she said, before it was all over, we got a divorce. So, you know, at least in her version of the story, he had been holding things in for 10 years. He never let anything out. He never told her what was on his mind. He never explained what he thought was wrong. And then when things blew up, they really blew up. They went nuclear. So try not to do that. The seventh thing this morning is give your spouse the benefit of the doubt, which, as I say in a, on a lot of topics, basically boils down to just be nice, okay? Be quick to forgive. Don't think the worst of your spouse. Don't interpret their motives as being something they may not be. Give them the benefit of the doubt. Be quick to forgive. 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 5 says, Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud, it does not dishonor others, it is not self-seeking, it is not easily angered, it is not easily angered, and it keeps no record of wrongs, okay? If you're in a relationship with anybody and you live under the same roof with them, if you want to find something to be offended about, there will always be something you can be offended about. Two adults trying to live under the same roof are going to have some friction, you know, because they want to do things one way and you want to do things the other way. And, you know, you have your way of doing things. You know, with Liz and me, I'll give you this example. We have two completely different biological clocks, okay, as different as they could be. Liz was raised on a farm. She's a farm girl. She gets up, you know, 5 o'clock in the morning, and when she wakes up, she's energized. She's like, yippee ki -yay, you know. <laughs> I am diametrically the opposite person. I can stay up till... Two o'clock in the morning doesn't phase me a lick. You ever want somebody you need to talk to at midnight? I'm your man. Okay? But I don't like mornings. I don't like to get up in the morning. You know? I don't even like to be around people who like to get up in the morning. I'm not a morning person. And so when we first got together in the same house... She would be up at 5 o'clock in the morning, and she's ready to go about her day. So she's cleaning the house, doing laundry, getting ready for work, doing all the stuff that she's doing. And in my mind, because it's 5 o'clock in the morning or 6 o'clock in the morning, and I'm completely irrational at that point anyway, I thought she was doing all that, making all that noise, and washing clothes and doing all that stuff just to spite me. I was like, she's just doing that to get on my nerves. What is wrong with her? You know? And we went round and round about that, didn't we, for, for a while, until we finally worked out the idea, and she explained to me, and I finally got the, it wasn't personal. In fact, she was really trying to be quiet. She had gotten, like, way quieter than she'd like to be, because at five in the morning, She'd like to have the stereo crank to be on the phone and tap dance across the floor. And she wasn't doing any of those things. 
because she was trying to let me sleep. But I was ascribing motives to her that weren't there. Right? That was part of my problem. And so I learned in that situation to give the other person the benefit of the doubt. Even if they do something that annoys you, doesn't mean they're intentionally doing that to annoy you. Does that make sense? Think the best of them rather than the worst of them. Don't be easily angered. Keep no record of wrongs, the scripture says. 1 Peter 4, 8 says, Above all, love each other deeply because love covers over a multitude of sins. When you really love somebody, your inclination should be not to focus on their faults or their aggravating points, but to, in fact, look over most of those things and think the best of them. Can anybody say amen? amen. Or oh me? <laughs> I can say a little bit of both. I've been on both sides of that. Um, and then finally, number eight, the last one is, don't quit. When you get married, you are one flesh, one person, one unit, the scripture says, therefore, a man shall leave his wife and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. Mark 10, 9 says, therefore, whatever God, what God has joined together, let no one separate. Just hang in there. I don't know of basically any marriage that lasts any length of time unless one of you has a heart attack on the way home from the church on your wedding day. I don't know of any marriage that lasts years that doesn't involve difficulty. You may not even have difficulty between each other. Most everybody does, but I'm saying even if you had the perfect relationship, and you never had a cross word, you're still going to have difficulty because even if your situation is perfect, the world's still going to be haywire. And you can get along with each other fine, and your kids can be crazy, or your in-laws can be crazy, or you can lose your job, or one of you can be become uh, disabled and sick and, you know, and need to be taken care of or a thousand other things can go wrong. There is always difficulty inherent in marriage. You will have tribulation of some kind, maybe with each other, maybe with some something else, but there will be trouble. But if the scripture seems to teach us anything, it's that even when difficulty arises, just tough it out. Hang in there. Keep putting one foot in front of the other. Take a deep breath. If you need to, go get in your car, drive around for an hour or so, come back home refreshed, and start all over again. But just keep going. Now, there are exceptions to that. I'm not, you know, I, I always want people to understand I under, that I understand that sometimes people are in a marriage where, for example, they're in physical danger. You may be married to somebody that's trying to kill you, you know, or you may be somebody who's a tyrant. That's not what I'm talking about. If you're in danger, get out, okay? That's not what I'm talking about. And, and if you got somebody who's perpetually cheating on you or somebody who's whatever, I'm saying there are exceptions. Almost nothing is 100% all the time. There are reasons you may need to get out. But most of the reasons people split up are not those reasons, in my observation. They split up because they just get tired of dealing with each other's junk. Or they just get tired of dealing with the world generally and take it out on their marriage. Or they've got some other stressor, like I said, like a chronic illness or a, something like that. There are all kinds of reasons that marriages blow up. But what the scripture seems to say to us and the Lord seems to say to us is, even when 
it gets tough. Just keep going. That spouse is one flesh with you. You are two parts of the same person. If God joined you together, the scripture says, I just read Mark 10, 9, then don't put asunder what the Lord has put together. There's a lot to be said by just being determined to stick it out sometimes. <clears throat> you know, so, so, so many people have the mistaken idea that's sold to us by our entire society from Hollywood to literature to pretty much everything, advertising and everything else, <clears throat> that your spouse is supposed to make you happy. Well, I got news for you. There is no other human being on earth who can make you happy. Sooner or later, you know, you're going to find out how mistaken that idea is. They make you happy when you're dating them. They make you happy when you're infatuated, when it's all new. And then you get married and you're together for a while and reality sets in. And you realize that person isn't perfect. That person doesn't know everything in the world. That person has some irritating habits. I don't know what, you know, they, they cut their fingernails and leave their fingernails on the bathroom sink or something, you know, their toenails or something. And something that just drives you nuts, you know. That's just part of it. But that person was never meant to keep you happy anyway. That person is there to be your partner, to be your lover, to be your friend, but they're not perfect and you're not perfect and your happiness does not come from another person. Your happiness comes from God and from the Holy Spirit and from being focused on Him. And your spouse, hopefully, is an auxiliary to that and, and is somebody you can depend on and that you care about and that you enjoy most of the time, but they're not the source of your happiness. And the fact that you're unhappy doesn't mean it's your spouse's fault. Happiness is a choice for the most part. You can be just as happy as you choose to be and as you let the Holy Spirit guide you to be. Right? No person can keep you happy. Your children can't keep you happy. The preacher can't keep you happy. Nobody can keep you happy but you and the Lord. Amen? So let me just restate each one of these, not preaching on them, don't, don't get scared. <laughs> Number one, be a servant. Number two, play to each other's talents. Number three, be thankful for who your spouse is. Number four, be faithful. Number five, listen. Number six, talk. Number seven, give your spouse the benefit of the doubt. Number eight, don't quit. Amen? Amen. If we do all those things, or even most of those things, we should get along in life pretty well, unless we determine that we're just, frankly, married to a psychopath. <laughs> But that's rare. That's only about 2% of people. So you're probably, the good news is, you're probably not married to a psychopath. So. <laughs> My guide to you in pre-marriage is, ask the Lord to show you whether that person's a psychopath. <laughs> we walk down the aisle. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you that you have the answer and the guides to every aspect of our lives. Lord, from the money we earn to our marriages, to our children, that you made us and you know how we operate and you know how we operate in a healthy way and how we operate in unhealthy ways. And Lord, let us have the insight and the self-discipline to follow you and operate in healthy ways. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. 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 God bless you. You're dismissed. Oh, <laughs> <laughs>